All right, special guest, Than from Tidal Gardens back with us. And uh, today it's called experimental stuff. You know, we've got a few things we're gonna cover, some things that you might implement uh, at your facility, you're always talking about. Mm -hmm. You gave me one statement that you can kind of like view the world that Than lives in, I'm gonna read here. So uh, it says, we have two buildings at Tidal Gardens with tanks. The new building, which if you haven't watched any of these videos, you should, because it's the coolest thing you've ever seen. Like you've never seen in your poor buddy do the coolest technology known to man, right? Go check it out. But also uh, the greenhouse, which is where Tidal Garden started, mm -hmm. right? So the greenhouse is where you do a lot of experimentation. Trying out new equipment typically happens in the greenhouse before we decide to implement it in the new building. We also brainstorm uh, entire system methodologies. Here are three that we might experiment with in the future, starting with a cascade water system. I got a bunch of notes in here, but what do you mean by cascade water change system? Okay, so the idea behind it, the, the, the thing that we were trying to solve for is trying to be efficient with our use of salt water. Uh, I, got, I don't know if you guys have like looked at prices lately, but salt is expensive. It's like really expensive. And I was thinking instead of whenever we do water changes or whatever, if, if there's ways that we could repurpose that water to still be productive and not be just a total disaster. So this idea didn't originate with me. I have heard other people dabble with it for like 30 years ago, but it's never really like caught on in any way, shape or form commercially these days like it's not something that's like oh this is this is the way to do give a give a just like a uh, the mile high overview of what it okay. would look like gotcha so let's say that you have like a, a very very clean sps tank and you want to do do a water change on that you would take that water and instead of just going down the drain you would use it to possibly grow like soft corals first and so your your water change on your sps tank is a de facto water change then on your soft coral tank. And then one step down from that, maybe it's going to feed like a decorative macroalgae system. So your mm. leather water change becomes an algae water change. So that same water cascades multiple different types of systems and you kind of get that conservation there. Okay, it almost kind of reminds me of like aquaponics. You know, especially kinda. when you get down to the plants, you know? Yeah, kind yeah. of, yeah. Like the fish, you know, go on to feed the plants, you know, essentially, mm -hmm. the fish waste. So you're like growing both, you know, like tilapia grows uh, plants and food fish at the same time. So the, the food pellet that goes in to feed the tilapia grows the food, also grows plants. Right. So, know? yeah. And so I guess you do get a conservation of like the, the, the feeding as well, like yep. uh, all the all your feeding inputs and everything like well, that. Yeah. So in this case, if you did what you said and they were all the same size, mm -hmm. right? That means I'm using one third as much water, mm -hmm. right? Cause I'm moving it down the case, you know, I'm going from the SPS tank, going to the uh, like LPS tank or softy tank, and then I'm going to uh, the plant tank. Mm -hmm. right? And then also the nutrients that came from that, you know, actually are a benefit to the things that happen to be below it. Maybe. Right, because the, because the things down the chain are going to want like a higher nutrient system. Okay, so, uh, you know, you had mentioned here, water changes from a cleaner tank going that de facto change on the mushroom or softy system that has a passive overflow to the drain. So, like, is it your belief that the mushrooms and softies, is it that they tolerate the more polluted water or they actually like it? In my experience, I, I've seen um, a lot of them benefit from a higher nutrient level. Like a, a lot of our systems tend to be like very clean and that's kind of more catered towards like the more sensitive stony corals and they happen to have mushrooms in it. The mushrooms are just okay. Mm -hmm. But in, in systems where I've seen like mushrooms really take off, it's like highly neglected gross looking tanks. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a, a, a cascading system like this would more or less like concentrate a lot of that gunk in the places where gunk would be appreciated by the animals. I mean, I hate to say it, but it's true. There are some corals that thrive in a neglected, poorly managed tank. Right? Yeah. Uh, I will tell you though, that those will end up being the only corals in that tank. Uh, all the rest of them eventually will kick the bucket along the way and not manage it. But these ones, man, will do well. 
Yeah. You know, yeah. The, the Xenia will do just fine. You know, uh, not always, but sometimes the zoanthids uh, will thrive in that environment. Yeah. And I was thinking of like different ways as to when you make that transition from like the, the one tank to the other, like you don't necessarily want to just put like all the f really gross food waste and all of that stuff through that process. So there's like a couple of like stages that I was thinking about incorporating. So first off, just to, to eliminate pathogens and stuff, just run UV if you're making that, if mm -hmm. you're making that, um, that transition over. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is something that I've, I've like seen in koei ponds, where let's, let's say that you are like directly like siphoning a substrate in one tank, and, but still wanted to use that really dirty water in the next tank. They have like these vortex filters, where um, like, like the, the, the most aggressive first filter uh, uh, just like spins all the crud down to the bottom and it has a, a cone bottom that you can open a valve and, and it, it expels all of the heavy material. And only like the, 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 light, uh, the light clean water gets to the next vortex filter and you, and you vortex it again, and you spin it again for like a third time. And then it goes back into the pond in, the, in this case. But in the, uh, in the cascade that I'm thinking, it would go through these vort vortices and then make it into like the next aquarium that you're looking to, to feed into, just to polish the water up a little bit. Have you ever used a diatomaceous earth filter? A long time ago in freshwater territory, I, I did. One of my uh, friends had uh, this on a reef tank, right? And it's, for those of you who don't know, it's like a, like a felt filter that you put this like kind of, uh, I don't know, like diatomaceous earth, it's like, it's like old coral shell or something like, or diatoms that are like powdery, right? Yeah. But it's like kind of that consistency. Very right? fine dust. Yeah. yeah. And then you put it in there and it swirls around and basically coats the, the side of the, the pleated filter and then creates this really fine kind of micron mesh that like only clean water will get through. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, could that be, you know, part of filtering out all the garbage, you know, from, you know, the used water? Yeah, it could be. I mean, essentially, that's just a very aggressive micron filter. Yep. And and I suppose there's there's ways you could do that. There's like filter socks. You yeah. could just like run it through like a filter sock system. Um, I've heard like like this diatom filters. Like basically, they won't even allow like ick through. You know, it's possible. Yeah, they're they're, they're so very small. small. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then I, I guess I get, in, in, the, in the circular thoughts, like, am I trying too hard to clean water when the, when the point was to make it slightly dirtier for these animals? Mm. But it, it was just like something I was experimenting with, just, just more to, to eliminate the transmission of pathogens, I would say. Okay, so actually uh, in that spirit, like even maybe easier then is uh, uh, like, a, you've seen those big blue, you know, sediment filters, mm -hmm. okay. So if some people use that uh, for parasite control in a tank because it can't make it through those things. So mm. it actually works as good as a UV, right? That's interesting. Because all the water that passes through it will capture uh, the uh, disease in those things. And then instead of trying to sterilize them, you take the filter out and throw them away. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So like, you know, if they had a, you know, as part of my process of filtering water that goes from this tank to that one, and setting it through like a really fine, you know, sediment filter. Even. Yeah, yeah, I interesting. Now, like, I don't know how much of this applies to a home environment unless you have a lot of different tanks, but. Right, it, it, I, I see this in like a more of like a, a bigger scale farm setting where you might be, you might be going through literally dozens of pallets of salt a year. And it's like, well, the, the logistics of getting that much salt, that type of expense, it's, it's one thing that, that uh, people don't really get about these like scaled up things because uh, I'm, I'm just at that scale where I need to do a lot of water changes, right? But there's scales above where I'm at when you're talking about like hundreds of thousands of gallons and they are trying to develop systems where they don't ever have to do a water change. I know people that are like involved in this and they attempt this and they struggle. Like they know full well if they do the water changes, all of these aquaculture systems are more productive. Like you don't have to debate why that is exactly, they just are, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately they don't want to go through that salt because it's A, uh, expensive and B, feels wasteful, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but like they sacrifice so much success 
chasing this carrot mm -hmm. that they haven't found the side to yet. You know, yeah, I, and, and it, it makes sense for like a public aquarium to try to conserve salt water that tightly. I'm just at the cusp of, uh, of where I still need to do a lot of water changes, but if I'm able to extend the life and applicability of that salt water, this might be a, a way to do that. You know, that comes, comes to mind here is like, you know, how does sometimes the things you do at commercial like boil down? Mm -hmm. So like, you know, I wouldn't run a sediment filter personally all the time because it just get clogged and it's another thing that I, I don't want to maintain, right? Mm -hmm. But like, what if, you know, instead of doing 10% water changes every single week, uh, I did uh, a like 10% water change three times a week, but then on the fourth one, all I did is open up a valve and for a week run that sediment filter and like strip out as much garbage as I can and just made the water that's in there better, mm -hmm. you know? Or maybe not even, maybe it's just only on for a day, you know? Mm -hmm. Use that filter that's fairly inexpensive, probably more inexpensive than the salt, you know? And use it for a day, pull out all the garbage out of it and, you know, mm -hmm. then throw it away uh, and then do it again. And like, can we learn these lessons? Because it kind of, it's like almost like an alternative to a water change rather than cascade of water change. And if we want it to be even less wasteful, I have seen some newer technologies that are, um, instead of using like like a, a filter sock type micron membrane, they have like a, a, a disc system where you can literally just take a stack of these discs that are acting like a micron filter and just like rinse it under a sink. And yeah. so you don't have to throw anything away. Oh. So there's there's like there's like more product development going on on, on that end. So huh. yeah, there's there's ways I think that can be that, that can be done like sustainably and effectively if that if that's the uh, the path. Yeah, I mean basically you had here like hey I take this water man I'm gonna water cascades over the filter socks it goes through a protein skimmer it goes through UV you know experiment with different things so that I can reuse this water again. Mm -hmm. you know, in a more aggressive manner. Yeah. Uh, all right. So the next one here is called, you know, experimental stuff at Tidal Gardens, maybe happening in the greenhouse first. And then if it works, uh, it goes on to the commercial end of it or the bigger end. The uh, crop rotation. So what does yes. crop rotation mean to you? Okay. So it's like an agricultural concept where you leave a field fallow for a year. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how that would, the analogy applying to tidal gardens would be, let's say that I've got a system that's made of 12 tanks. It is to intentionally leave one of those tanks completely dry and empty. Okay. And then almost like do like a leapfrog effect where I would take um, all the corals and fish in one tank, clean them up, dip them, whatever it takes, put them into the dry tank, fully break down that tank that they came from, leave that dry. And then again, cascade those guys over and over and over. So the point of, of to, to, to do that is that when you hard reset a tank like that, you, um, you get ahead of so many chronic issues that plague large production systems. Like old tank syndrome. You know, I don't know what happens a year or whatever, but like things just catch up with you and you don't know what they are necessarily. And some of them are yeah. very visible pests and some of them aren't. Right, and there's there's stuff that that likes to hang out in your plumbing that you'll never see, mm -hmm. like stuff like that. So in an, in a large interconnected system, uh, it is very 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 difficult to eliminate all your problems. So so at best you're really trying to manage problems. A hard reset of a single tank buys you so much time, and buys you so much stress relief, and so to always have an empty tank ready to go and just like. To like uh, once a month, you got 12 tanks, you got 12 months. Once a month, break down a tank, swap it over. Break down a tank, swap it over. Granted, you're losing 8% of your production capabilities, but that 8% manifests in so much uh, like ease of future maintenance on stuff. I think it's like a, a, a no-brainer. Okay, I can't tell, man, I'm fascinated by this idea because like nobody would do it for the reason that you described. I can't reduce 20% of my total output, right? Mm -hmm. But like there is some truth to like, you know, established tanks grow coral better, right? Like they just established is a mythical word, but like, you know, things that have been up and healthy and robust just grow coral faster and better. 
But man, like if I had a tank that was one year, two year, three year, four year, five year, zero year, mm -hmm. and I cycled these things back through, and so there was an empty one kind of in between, basically like all those things that like you know people may tell you other oh, systems are pest free and whatever that's it's garbage man like i i've, I've yet to encounter one. i've never seen it yeah I, like behind the scenes just it, from from people that really know what they're doing yeah it's yeah, it, yeah. it's it's very challenging it's not a safe thing to say out loud man but like it's just like things happen especially in any system that's getting consistent like you know corals from the wild yeah right? like an influx of new stuff and every yeah major uh, major farm is trying to get new stuff how do you get thousands and thousands of course you can definitely limit this stuff and you mm -hmm. can limit the you know like how bad the problem might be uh, but like at one of the wholesalers we used to play this game called uh, like on all the stuff that we would buy count the abtasia from what you see what you get and every photo man all of them 100 of them had abtasia in oh, in, wow. in the background of where the corals were sitting Right, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't imagine I'd see this in your farm, but like at the same time, there's definitely aptasia, but it's not a, it's not horrific, problematic levels. Could I play yeah. that game? <laughs> uh, so, but like, dude, like things build up, man. The vermited snails, the bubble mm -hmm. algae, the whatever, like they come in from somewhere, you know. Like unless you're just somehow immaculately perfect in the way that nobody has ever seen, uh, then like. You know, you let these things kind of, you know, become the problem that they are, and then you hard reset. But I have all of these tanks because corals grow well in established tanks. I have these tanks of one, two, three, four, five, mm -hmm. right? And I'm actually eliminating the worst performing one at the end that may have had some of the issues. And you could actually do this in a variety of ways. It could be one, two, three, four, five. It could be like one, two, three. You know, mm -hmm. but always, man, there's established tanks that produce. You know, mm -hmm. and so there's actually uh, so the. The idea that like the established tank is the one that, that grows coral, I think um, in, in like a hobbyist show tank, I, I, I very much agree with that. But I think that when you're talking about like a farming setting, what tends to happen is the tanks that, that, that get neglected are the ones that are going to struggle. Like the little deep, dark corners that you might not have been paying close enough attention, that's where something awful is going to start growing. So the more that you can dote on your tanks, the more that you can clean stuff, that's what makes corals grow. Like when it comes to, the, let's just say, uh, like very, very fast growing fancy acros, as long as there's nothing actively eating them, they're probably gonna do pretty well. But it turns out there's a lot of stuff that bothers Acropora. And, and in, in the big farm scale settings, it's, it's a challenge to control that to the point where it's not existent, but you want to be on top of all of that. And that's when like the, the, the dipping in between transfers really helps. That's when the whole tank treatments help. And this technique that I'm talking about where you're, where you're just breaking down an entire tank and putting it uh, wholesale into a new one, essentially. That, oh my gosh, it, is, it, it was like a revelation when we started to do some, some stuff like this. But to have it on like a, on a 12 unit system and just do it, do it monthly, I think that there's uh, there's a future for that. So one of the notes you had in here was, as you think about this topic, and potentially on continuous feeding systems for non-photosynthetic corals. Okay. So yeah. I I got I'm gonna let you say it, but like immediately now I get it. Like why this might be valuable specifically to this. So the 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 great thing about having like a large coral farm is that it is large. So when you do like a feeding for like a, like a heavy feeding that you would never do on an isolated aquarium, you can do now provided that you flush it into the bigger system. So I was thinking about having like a dedicated um, tank, small tank, let's just say under 50 gallons, but jam pack it full of uh, these like really difficult to care for non-photosynthetic corals that constantly need to be fed. Practically, c consistently 12 hours a day, let's say. And uh, I would maintain like the, the nutrient load in that by effectively doing a 100% water change daily on that thing by like, you know, cranking it up from um, like another system entirely and having it overflow back into that system. And that feeds an entire, let's say a thousand gallon system where that amount of food isn't going to be impactful to that, to that system's chemistry. So that was kind of like my idea of where, like how can I get the food density needed to like make these things go crazy and then immediately clean it. Okay, so like, 
this immediately applies to some of the things we're talking about here to me, which is like, how do I, one of the coolest, easiest ways to set up another tank is plumb it into your existing tank. Mm -hmm. So set up, you know, I got a 120. Well, instead of going and buying a 180, go buy a 60 cube and plumb it into the same sump. You know, mm -hmm. it's way cheaper, less gear, and you're not maintaining like you now two return pumps, more heaters, more all this stuff. You're not consuming all this money and time and wires and stuff. You're just kind of like, you know, connecting into a, an existing system. But in this case too, like, what if I wanted to do, you know, like a non photosynthetic system, like maybe like a small little like 12 cube or something mm -hmm. where I could put, you know, once or twice a day, like high density food in here, that then ultimately, you know, goes into my 120. So hit the feed button and it's, it can disconnects for an mm -hmm. hour. You know, it circulates all that food in there yeah. and then goes in. What a cool way to add a new style of tank that mm -hmm. solves a problem for me that if I just left that food in there, it would pollute. Mm -hmm. But it instantly gets diluted by 90% as soon as it goes in there, probably feeds other stuff. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then also the filtration will now get it as well. Right. Yep. I mean, especially if you think about it in the terms of, you know, pollute the hell out of that tank, essentially, mm -hmm. right? Like put all this food in there and then when it escapes, it has to go through the roller mat, the, uh, you know, skimmer and all those chambers that just kind of removes all that stuff up before. All the uneaten tank. stuff. Yeah. I yeah. want to try so bad now. <laughs> uh, I, that was such a cool thing. I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm going to plug one into the 360 this way. Oh, nice. Nice. I can't help it. I want to. And because uh, like, cause I, th I think a lot of it is just to be able to feed green water levels where it's like murky to look at. Mm -hmm. um, and then like leave that thing circulating for, let's say, hours. And the like one time I I'll give you like a little fun, fun story. I, I once tried to do like the continuous feeding thing, like on a dosing system with a refrigerator and all that stuff. Yep. And something got messed up, guys. And I ended up... Uh, like so some part of it failed and essentially it dosed a year's worth of phytoplankton in one day. Ooh. And my, it was a thousand gallon system and the water, you couldn't see f like five inches into it. It was green, green. Okay. Um, but like my ultra delicate, like dendronephthia, the carnation corals and stuff like that were five times the size. Oh, wow. instantly like five times the size. So I'm like, okay, well clearly that is an effective way to make them happy. I just can't make a green water situation, right? But maybe with this type of like semi-isolated system where you can just turn the turn it into a green water system for an hour a day and then so clean like, it up. I bet you that, you know, it's like these non-photosynthetic corals. It's not usually like, you know, all day long, there's just tons of flu food you know, swim around because these would be polluted reefs if that was the case and you'd probably mm -hmm. get tons of algae and stuff. What it is, it happens at night. You know, there's blooms of bacteria and blooms of plankton and stuff that happens that it's really high density. In fact, you can go there and the water's like all cloudy, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, at, and they just before dawn Something stuff. like marine snow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So like what you just described is, you know, you know, a thousand times or whatever the phytoplankton, you've created this high density environment where this is where it might capture this food in pulses and mm -hmm. then it dissipates. Yeah. Uh, like, oh man. Worth experimenting uh, with, right? Uh, well, that's today's topic, experimental stuff, you know, yeah. stuff that you want to do there, but how, how does this apply at home too? I can't, I can't, I can't wait. Uh, okay, the next one here is overflows into larger systems, but maximizes contact time with the non-photosynthetic corals. Small enough to maintain some non-photos uh, fish eat that. this. No, this is actually the thing that we just talked yeah. about. Yep. <laughs> uh, it's hilarious. <laughs> okay, well, that was definitely the flow into it. All right, well, you know what? There's more of FAN to come. Uh, we have uh, additional episodes. All of our special guests in a playlist right here. So uh, check it out and learn some more. Bye, guys. <laughs>